Um, so let me introduce myself. I did very quickly earlier. My name is Justin Lee. Uh, I am the Director of Government Relations with the, the League of Cities and Towns. I've been in this role for, oh, I don't know, five and a half months, maybe something like that-ish. It was end of August. Prior to this role, um, I was the Director of Elections in the Lieutenant Governor's Office. Um, some of you are maybe recognizing that now, and that may not be a good thing. Um, so I, I need to say, um, if, if in the 10 years I was at the Lieutenant Governor's office, um, your city ever called me with an elections issue or a referendum issue or whatever it was, and I was not on your side, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I am on your side now. I work with you, um, and and if I was if I was intransigent on something before, then I will be intransigent with the legislature on behalf of the league on certain things. So just just know that that's that's where I and I I, I feel like I should tell one more story about that um, and, and how good I am at government relations. Um, when when I was a staffer in Lieutenant Governor's office, part of the governor's office, we had a flag football game one time, um, and and the governor Gar Gary Herbert was the quarterback. Um, for the opposing team. And, and he was the quarterback. If you know anything about Gary Herbert, you know he's, he's big in athletics, played baseball, football, tennis, um, all kinds of things. Um, and he, he was a good quarterback. And so I, I, was, gonna, I was gonna blitz the quarterback. Um, and it was, it was two touch. Um, that being said, when I, when I blitzed the quarterback, I ended up tackling Gary Herbert. Um, and and, and he, I, I went to two touch him and he moved and we got tangled up and went down and I tackled the governor. And if you've ever seen his security guys, uh, they get really jumpy when you tackle the governor. And so they, they, they sat up, they were sitting down on benches, but they sat up really quickly. Um, and all the governor did though, was put his hand on my chest and watched his pass that he had thrown before I tackled him, saw the guy catch it, and he goes, good hit. And then he got up and got going. So I am good enough to tackle the governor and still keep my job. Um, so we'll, we'll keep on that trend. Um, but we're here to talk about um, how legislative policy works in the league, um, what our legislative efforts are, and then I've got a string of slides that is designed to do nothing but keep you up at night uh, for all the issues that we need to look at. Um, so let's, let's jump forward. Um, all right, so Cam talked about this a little bit earlier, but we have foundational principles that we use whenever we're working with the legislature, working with cities. Um, and these are respect, collaboration, and outcomes. Uh, these are the building blocks that, that we use and we represent our local, uh, local government interests. So we want the state legislature and state agencies to respect the role of local government. Um, at the same time, we respect their role and things that they're over. We want to collaborate um, so that it's, it's a two-way street, that we're talking to each other both ways so we can get the best outcomes. Uh, next, we have our legislative policy prism. Um, and when I pop it up here, it'll look really familiar. Cam put this up there before, but I do want to just talk about it again really quickly. But all our bills are examined with this policy prism on, on three foundational principles. Does the bill respect the traditional role of local government? Again, back to that respect. Is the bill a one-size-fits-all approach, or does it respect that every city is unique? A lot of, a lot of times we'll say you know, one-size-fits-no-one, um, or one-size-misfits-all. Um, every city is unique, and everybody si every city has, has their own little things that they need to work on. So we, we don't like one-size-fits-all approach. And three, will the bill result in an unfunded or unworkable mandate on cities? Um, that's something we want to avoid. As someone who used to work uh, for, for the executive branch um, of the state government, I can tell you the legislature doesn't always care about unfunded mandates, um, and I have loads of stories about that, but we, we do our best to make sure that, that those unfunded mandates don't get down there. Um, so this is again mentioned earlier, but I want to talk about our legislative policy committee. Um, this is really the committee that gives us our policy guidance and takes, um, takes positions on, on issues, takes positions on bills during the legislative session. So just to reiterate what was said earlier, every city and town can elect three voting members from their mayor, council members, or senior staff. Um, or if we have someone on the board from your city, you may have four members. Actually, right now, I think we have someone who's eligible for five because uh, we have multiple board members from one city. Um, a, a past president and then a current uh, council member. And then anyone's welcome to participate in those meetings. During the legislative session, the LPC, Legislative Policy Committee, LPC, um, I know we throw a lot of acronyms around, um, the LPC meets weekly and we'll present bills, we'll take positions on those bills, and then that gives us as staff 
um, the direction we need to go and advocate on behalf of the cities or go present our positions to legislators or in committee meetings. Um, LPT takes positions on legislation by a 60% uh, consensus vote. Um, the Legislative Policy Committee typically meets once a month when the legislature is not in session. Um, and this is where we meet. Um, if you've been to LPC meetings before, this feels familiar. This is the room we meet in for LPC meetings throughout the year. Uh, during the session, though, that's on the Capitol, uh, but we do have virtual options as well. All right, Legislative Policy Committee may also create smaller working groups. Um, and that's my, my cue to give you one rem more reminder. Um, if you haven't fill, for, filled out that sheet yet, um, that, that says the things you're interested in, the policy areas. Um, please fill that out, drop it off in the table. Um, but this is where we take some of that information. We have smaller working groups, because um, there's not time in 90 minutes once a month to talk about all the issues that are out there. But we work on things justice courts, short-term rentals, homelessness, land and water issues, fireworks, eminent domain, just to name a few that we've been working on recently. So there are, if you take nothing away from, from my presentation of this, there are plenty of opportunities if you want to be involved in the legislative policy space to work with the League um, and to take positions to help us craft policy. All right, we're, we'll talk about this, but um, we have an objective. Um, we, have, we have a, well, I'll talk about it more, but Cities Work um, is, is, a, is, a, is a program, it's an objective, it's, it's a lifestyle at this point that we live all the time, whether it's talking to legislators or talking to our own constituents. Um, but this part I want to talk about is building relationships of trust with legislators and ensuring they are more responsive to you as city leaders than they are to special interest groups. Um, I'm sure you know um, that legis the legislative session takes 45 days, happens end of January to early March every year, but legislation is being crafted year round, and special interest groups and lobbyists are meeting with legislators all year round. So the question is, are you as well? Are you having those contacts with legislators? Are you talking to them? Are you telling them your stories? Um, I'm sure you also know that legislation gets generated by anecdotes a lot of time. Um, Something happens to one constituent, they have a bad experience somewhere, they go tell the legislator and we get a bill about it, even though it was a very, very narrow circumstances. And we'll talk about this more in, more in just a minute, but if you're not telling your side of the story, that one anecdote may be driving all of the policy. All right, so let's talk about what are the issues that we, we're going to be seeing in the upcoming session, um, issues that are they're going to be with us for a very long time. And so I call this one the obvious slide. Um, because we're going to talk about growth. Utah is the nation's fastest growing state. That's not a shocker. I think we all know that at this point. Um, Utah's population growth tops the nation for the decade. So we're growing fast. We're growing from people coming from out of state here. We're growing from people who we create on our own and they want to stay here. Um, but we're growing and we need to deal with that. This is an, uh, another slide that I'm sure you've seen. Legislative issues is water. Um, this is from September. Um, the good news is, if you saw the news in the last couple of days, um, the, the dark red is exceptional drought. Um, and, and I could have picked almost any week from this last summer, summer and showed a similar slide. The good news is Utah is no longer exceptional in the one category of drought right now. We're exceptional in every other way, I'm sure. But in the category of drought, nowhere in the state is exceptional as of this week. That doesn't mean you saw the water presentation, it doesn't mean we're out of the woods by any stretch. But we need to talk about water and there's a lot of things that are going to come up around water, not just this year, but for, for several years to come. Um, this is uh, taken directly from the governor's, uh, governor's website. Uh, these are things that he would like to see done and so that's going to help us inform what the discussion is around water leading into the legislative session. Um, you're going to hear a lot of discussion, there's uh, probably four or five bills um, or at least legislators who are interested in running bills, dealing with buying back turf um, or getting rid of turf in unnecessary places. Um, you know, it's the, it's the park strips. It's the, it's the grass that nobody ever walks on unless they're mowing it. Um, we need to talk about what do we do with that graf grass? What kind of ordinances do we have around that, uh, around using turf or allowing other types of landscaping to take place? Um, secondary water metering. A lot of the state's metered, a lot of the state is also not metered right now. So there's going to be questions about when is that required, how long are we going to have to get those meters in, and who's going to help pay for that. 
Good news in that front is there is some money available that, that will probably be put out there to help pay for secondary water metering uh, for, those, for those areas that don't have it. Um, but there's going to be a lot of discussion around that. And you're going to hear me say that over and over. There's going to be discussion around that. There's going to be bills around that. We're not here to have the in-depth policy discussion. I just want to put on your radar the different issues we've got out there. And then let me also emphasize that you shouldn't feel like you need to engage on every one of these issues. But if there are issues that are very important to your city, if there's ones that matter more than others, those are the ones that we want to we wanna team up and work together on. Um, integrated land use and water planning. A lot of times when we make our land use decisions, um, in the past we haven't thought a lot about what that means for water. Um, we need to start thinking about that. When we're building things, um, when we're landscaping, what does that mean for water? So the league actually working with, um, with Prep 60 was here earlier, uh, the H2O collective that was mentioned, um, working with the, the Utah Water Task Force, working with our own legislative policy committee, um, we have legislation that we have proactively worked on that would ask cities and counties to look at their general plan and integrate land use and water use decisions together. Whenever we consider land use, we need to consider how that's going to impact water usage. And so you will see some legislation that's been worked through of all of our committees uh, coming up in this session. And then agricultural optimization, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, just one more thing that the, the governor has on his list. Um, so I mentioned non-functional turf, um, just to throw a couple headlines up there. Nevada enacted a ban on non-functional turf. Um, there's another one. Um, Utah's governor is interested in something like that. Um, this is going to be a discussion. So if your city doesn't let people do any landscaping other than turf, you're in for a surprise here coming up pretty quickly, and we're going to have to deal with that. Secondary water metering, I mentioned that. I won't spend more time on that one. Um, housing. Um, let's talk about housing for a minute, though, because there are a lot of issues around housing that we need to deal with. Um, we realize that, for the most part, cities do not build houses. Um, you're not in the housing business. You're not developers. Um, you might be in your day job in some cases, but as a city, that's not what you do. But Zoning, ordinances, things like that have an impact on the housing stock. Um, lots of discussions, lots of negotiations going around housing. Um, if you're one of those rapid growth cities, other cities that are having housing issues, um, this is going to be a big one that you're going to want to pay attention to. Um, the, the, this, is, this should be called the scary slide, not the obvious slide. Um, one of the things that's been brought up is getting rid of single family zoning. Um, California. Looked at getting, has looked at and has actually gotten rid of single family zoning. Um, there are people who are interested in doing that here in Utah as well. Um, I call the scary slide. I don't think this is where we're going this legislative session, but I am throwing it up there just to say people are having a lot of discussions around housing. And it's not just in California. Our very people in the Deseret News opinion, of course, it's not from the news, but are talking about that as, here as well. Um, missing middle housing. Um, has, has anybody heard the term missing middle, ha missing middle housing before, some of you? If not, this is going to be something that's going to come up as well. Um, what is missing middle housing? Well, it's that stuff in the middle. We've got detached single family homes. You've got your apartments on the far side there. But it's all the, the duplexes, um, fourplexes, fiveplexes, um, side-by-sides, courtyard buildings, lots of different things that we don't always have uh, and that we call it missing middle because it's missing from a lot of cities, a lot of areas plans, or what's even allowed in some places. So there's discussion about how do we get some of that housing to, to people who, who need it because I don't think anyone's shocked at, at the need for housing right now or what housing prices look like. And then retail incentives. Um, as far as I know, in the six months I've been with the league, this, is, this has been the thing that we've talked about the very most. It's a really big deal. Um, basically, the idea is um, there are legislators uh, and the governor who, who are really interested in making sure that, not making sure that's the wrong way of saying it, who don't want public funds to be used to incentivize retail. And there are a lot of ways that cities use public funds sometimes to incentivize retail to come into their cities. And so there, there is going to be legislation on this. Um, and there's a few different approaches. Um, one approach is just to say you cannot use funds, public funds, to incentivize retail, period. That's where it started. And then there may be some exceptions. Or there could be an approach that better defines what big box retail is, is about, because that's really what we're talking about more is, is cities not competing against each other for big box retail. But this is another issue that, that is coming up. Um, 
and that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Um, and then a couple more short-term rentals. This is, this is a, an issue that we're talking about, ADUs. Um, we had some good discussion in, the, in, in our lunch about what, what's going on in a few cities there. Um, and then public safety. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that, that we have a shortage of officers um, and that we're having a hard time recruiting them. There's another issue that we need to talk about and deal with. So if I've kept you up at night now and you have a long list of things um, that, that, are, that are concerning to you, then I've done my job. Um, but don't despair because we're, we're here to help you and, and to work on that. And again, don't feel like you need to tackle every single issue. But I do want to talk about, again, the Cities Work initiative. So what is Cities Work? Uh, you're going to hear us talk about it a lot. We have the cool stickers out there that you can put on things. It's a call to action and it encourages our members to tell their story and develop the relationship with not just legislators, but tell your story to your constituents as well. Um, so I'm going to run through these really quickly because um, if, if I have any goal today, it's to get you out of here on time. Um, but one, need you to identify your legislators. Cam asked the question earlier, but how many, how many of you right now know your legislators? Okay, keep your hands up. Don't put them down yet. How many of you have talked to your legislator in the last year? All right, pretty good. Last six months. Last three months. Okay, you guys are doing great. Um, legislative session is coming up. That is a really good time to talk to legislators, but it is not the best time to talk to legislators. <laughs> they get really busy. They, and, and I'm not blaming them at all. They get really, really busy. There's a lot going on in that 45 days. But if you can get them during the interim, if you can get them those relationships established earlier, it's going to be so much easier to shoot that text off or make that call, send that email during the session, and have them respond when they already know you. There was a special session. Um, I'm sure everyone knows this. They redistricted. So if you have not yet looked at these, um, go look up the, the redistricting maps. Find out if you have a new legislator covering your city. Another really good time to talk to a legislator is before they're a legislator. Candidates always want to talk to people. I'm sure you know as having been candidates. But a candidate gets really excited if somebody wants to talk to them and, and you know, give them some social media shout out. So this next spring, this next summer, this next fall as people are running for seats, that's a really good time to reach out and talk to them as well. Um, so, so you can get ahead of that one. To connect, this can be all kinds of things. Um, you can set up a luncheon, take them on a tour, do a ribbon cutting, uh, bring them to one of your new parks, whatever it is, but connect with those legislators and then take the chance uh, to tell your story. What's the blue square story of your city? How can you give context to the issue that they're dealing with? Find out from them what are the issues they're concerned about and see if there is a way that, that we can help them and find out if that's a valid issue or explain to them how their issue really isn't. I'm not going to say it's not valid, but their issue is maybe not completely well informed. Um, but take those opportunities. It'll pay huge dividends for us. Um, quick scene on this, but more about telling your story. But the strength of the league um, isn't just in, in us as staff, it's in you. And the more you can connect with the legislators, the more you know about secondary water metering and how that's going to impact your city, the more you know about non-functional turf in your city, and you have that connection with the legislator, the more we can do up on the hill. Um, when when we, have, we have not just, uh, not just a group of people here, we call it the League Army, and you're that army. So please connect with your legislators. Please reach out to us if you need help making those connections, and, and let's tell our stories. Um, and with that, I will end there. Um, Mike, do you want to come talk now, or do you want to go in just a minute? Okay, sorry, Matt. We'll, we'll have Mike Maurer come up and talk to us right now. And let me, if you don't know Mike Maurer, Mike has worked for the governor's office for like 100 years, I think, at this point. Uh, governor Blood. Really close, right? <laughs> but Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell everyone why you're here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mike Maurer, and I am in the governor's office. I've uh, started, my first day on the job was with Governor Huntsman, and uh, then with Governor Herbert, now with Governor Cox, and do a lot of work with communities. And so I appreciate all of you and all of what you're doing. Uh, I'm an attorney by profession, but spent four years at Provo City uh, directing government affairs, so I know the issues that you deal with, and I know how tough uh, the local issues are because your friends and your neighbors are on the phone. It's things that you're dealing with, whether it's a stoplight or new roads or water infrastructure. I can appreciate the challenges that you're facing in places like uh, Spanish Fork and other areas. The governor gets it too. Uh, as you may know with the governor's background, 
he started out, he moved to Fairview, Utah, back home to Fairview. He was practicing law at Fabian and Clendenin here. And his dad said, hey, come home, help me run the family company. He took a big pay cut, went back to Fairview. He's there in town three months, and um, they asked him to be on the city council. And he's like, oh, okay, I guess we're on the city council. Well, then he quickly found out it's because the city couldn't afford an attorney, and they had a big lawsuit facing the town of Fairview. <laughs> And then he ended up as uh, the mayor of his small town of Fairview. For those of you who are familiar with, with Utah and the predominant faith, you're asked to serve in different positions. While he was serving as mayor of Fairview, he was also asked to be an LDS bishop. And so as he tells the story, as the mayor, he would shut off people's water on Friday for not paying their uh, water bill. And as the bishop, he would give them a check on Sunday so that they could get it turned back again on Monday. So he comes with a really good perspective of what it's like to be involved in local government and to do those sorts of things. So I'm uh, from Farron, Utah. Anyone heard of Farron? OK. Farron, it's the best town in Utah, but all of you come from a close second. I mean, all of you come from great areas. I love small town government. As, as a seven-year-old went to the swearing-in of our mayor and of our city council in Farron, Darwin Larson, back in 1974, so you can do the math. And, and from that moment as a kid, it was so impressive. I thought that was so cool that our neighbors were there taking an oath of office to, to help out our, our town of Farron. I'm here to help you out as well. Um, your legislators are key in the next 45 days because they're the ones that are distributing the money and the funds and are passing the laws. We work closely with them. We work extremely closely with the league. And I've been in the governor's office 17 years. We've always had a good relationship with the league. Right now, we have a particularly great relationship with the league. We're on the phone every few weeks with your leadership team. The governor, one of his favorite people in the state is Mayor Don Ramsey, who's your president this year. The league does great work, and you need to be involved in the league. And I'm saying this as someone who's, you, you've got a league army and you're it. You don't have powerful, uh, um, you know, these big lobbyists that you can hire. You're, you're the representing your citizens, and your league staff does a terrific job. So I'm going to pass out my cards here. Um, I, this is, I love doing this. Feel free to contact me nights, weekends. Um, I'm on social media a lot. That's a great way to reach out. So if you've got a problem in Spanish Fork, or you've got a problem in Hennifer, or a problem in Price that needs a governor's office attention, let me know. Whether it's an issue with UDOT or some other issue, I'm there in the, in the governor's office to make sure we make it work out really well. One quick thing, I promised the governor, the governor said, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm going to go talk to the league. Oh, really? I bet you don't. I'm going to take a quick selfie. So everybody <laughs> smile so the governor knows Mike Maurer was working today. Mike Maurer on a Saturday. OK, so there we go. Liz, yeah. That is going to get like 15 likes on Twitter. That is really cool.